All right, you guys, as you can see by the thumbnail, I'm back with another one like the other one. Not that one, but this one. And I'm going to get straight into it. So check it out, you guys. I got another good story for you guys. And this one right here is like all the other stories that I've told you guys about. These kind of things are playing out on different yards by different people and different faces. But you have the same common denominators. Betrayal, somebody doesn't conform to the drug policy or some other kind of policy that is implemented and then they're getting removed. Where is the carnalismo? What happened to the cause? What happened to you know the times when we cared about our people, when we went that extra mile to try to save them? When you see somebody drowning, you don't watch them drown or you don't weigh them down and help them drown. You try to pull them out the water and save them. But you don't see people doing that anymore. Somebody trips up, they stumble, they fall, and then you got other people kicking them while they're down. That's what happens. This story right here, is, it's another cold story. I mean, it has a lot of similarities to a lot of the other stories that I've told you guys in the past. But this one right here kind of highlights what happens when prison politics end up having an adverse effect on, on family or your, your personal relationships, a wife, you know, your kids, your mom, your old lady, whatever it is. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get no sympathy because nobody cares, especially if it's got something to do with interfering with money or interfering with dope coming in. Nobody wants to hear it. Bottom line is you need to make it happen. And if you don't, you're done. You're expendable. A lot of people are learning the definition of what it really means to be expendable and how fast it can happen. So this story right here, it took place in Wasco State Prison, I want to say sometime around 2016 on a yard. And I'm going to try to run you guys through this story kind of fast because I know my story has been kind of long. There's two incidents that I'm going to get into. Some of you are asking if I can shorten them up. Others, you want longer stories, I'm just going to mix them up. So my source, who I'm now going to refer to as Weddle, when he first hit this yard, the yard was being ran by Sana from F Troop. Sana had the yard, and from everything that he said, the yard was being ran smooth. He said there was a lot of good sureños on that yard. They were hitting dope, they were generating money, and it was a smooth program. But then Woody from Compton took over. So when he first got there, that transition was just starting to happen. Woody was just starting to take that yard over. And, you know, when Woody got there, he, once he got himself situated, once he appointed his mess, his, his entourage and his security and all that good stuff, that's when he started to organize the yard. That's when he started to implement policies, a new set of reglas. And there was a lot of things that he changed on that yard that, you know, according to Wero and a lot of other Sureños that were out there, these changes weren't for the betterment of the yard. They were self-serving. And Woody apparently was pushing a hard line. You know, like Weddle said, there's always going to be tension between the Orange County and the L.A. County cars. That's just something that's going to happen no matter who's running the yard. But he said at least, you know, when Sano was running the yard, there was some kind of harmony out there on the yard. There wasn't no conflict. You know, there's, there's always going to be that tension. But the yard was, it was a good yard. And then Woody hit the yard and things started changing. And those, those two policies are the basis of this story right here. Whenever you have policies like this that change, especially these kind of policies, they eventually end up having an adverse effect on somebody. And unfortunately, some of these guys are learning, you know, the definition of what it means to be expendable and how fast it can happen. So Weddle said that not long after Woody got there and he started to organize the yard, he implemented a new set of reglas and policies that specifically pertain to removals and the routes that they were using, you know, to get their drugs in. With regards to the removals, Woody implemented a no refusal policy for all removals that anyone is asked to participate in. Basically, if you were asked to participate in a removal, you didn't have any latitude or any room to say, I'm short or, you know, I participated in the last one or can I sit this one out? There was no justification for you to refuse any removals. The way that Woody was looking at it was this is a responsibility of all Sureños on this yard. Whenever we have trash that hits this yard or whenever somebody violates some kind of infraction that constitutes a removal, that this is a burden that 
you know, rests on all of our shoulders, not just a specific few or not just those that owe removals as a form of discipline, but this is a sacrifice that all Sureños should embrace because this is part of securing our household. This is part of, of cleansing the household, removing the trash or those that got that coming. So based on the fact that Woody implemented this new policy regarding the, the removals, I'm assuming that they may have been given an option before in the past or that there might have been some exceptions. But Woody changed all that and made it a mandatory requirement. If you were asked to participate in a removal, whether it was a shooter or a bomber, the only thing that you could say is point me in the right direction. They didn't want to hear that you were two weeks to the house or that you know you had a personal relationship with this individual and you'd rather not participate or that you know you participated in the last removal. One of the things that Woody stipulated was that we've already done our research and we've already investigated the circumstances behind this removal. We've already looked and seen who's short to the house. We've already investigated who participated in the last removal. We've already investigated where this individual is from, who he kicks it with and all that good stuff. So there's no justification for refusal or to ask to sit this one out. Bottom line, you're obligated. With regards to the drug policy, Woody made it clear that it was the responsibility of every Sureño on that yard to contribute all within their means and to assist bringing drugs in however they could. That meant it was mandatory for anyone who got visits, regular visits or family visits, to bring drugs in with the understanding that they were helping to make a financial contribution for the entire collective. In other words, if you were fortunate enough to get a visit, if you were somebody that went out to the visit every weekend or you had people that were willing to drive two or 300 miles to come all the way out there to see you and you, know, you had an opportunity to bring drugs in, that you needed to understand and embrace the concept of contributing to the household, that you were making a contribution for the collective because everybody wasn't fortunate enough to get a visit. And if you were in that visiting room, that means you had the opportunity to bring drugs in. And they pitched this as if you were making a contribution to the casa, to the house, that this wasn't a burden or a sacrifice, that this was you doing your part as a sureño on that yard. So it's a cold game, but if you got a visit, if you were somebody that got visits, you were a target. The visiting room was closely monitored on that yard. They monitored who got visits. And if you weren't somebody that was forthcoming or took the initiative to go tap in with the Mesa, hey, I get visits every week. My lady comes up or I got family that comes up, brother, sister, whoever it is. They come up to see me once a week or once every other week. If you didn't take the initiative to report that, they would come and get at you. Hey, you know, we see that you get visits on a, on a bi-weekly basis or that you get visits every week. So this is what we need you to do. I've talked about this in several of my other stories. The visiting room has always been one of the main points of entry when it comes to bringing drugs in. If somebody doesn't got a CO in the pocket, they don't got somebody knocked, they're not having a relationship with one of the female officers, they don't got somebody manipulated, the visiting room is a secure and definite route because visits don't stop. They happen every week and you're out there, you're with your people and you get contact visits because visits don't stop. They happen every week or however they run it. And you're out there with your people, you have contact with them and you have the means to bring it in. So Weddle said that when Woody changed the reglas, that he made it very clear that we're all sureños out here together. It's all of our responsibility to generate money and therefore, it's not just on selective individuals to bring in the dope or to pull all the work. Everybody's got to do their part. And of course, this was all implemented and coerced under the threat of violence. If you don't bring in our drugs when you have the opportunity, you got an issue coming, period. Bottom line is they need to understand that as a Sureño, there's expectations that you have to fulfill, that you have to live up to. And it didn't matter if you were getting a visit from your mom, if it was your wife with your kids, it didn't matter. Bottom line is, if you were out there in the visiting room, you have an opportunity to bring it in. And that's all that matters. Weddle said that he personally got what was called a canetada every time he didn't bring drugs in when he went out to a family visit. Every time he didn't bring it in, he got a canetada. So a canetada is basically a 39 second beat down. It's a form of hands-on discipline, something that I've never personally believed in with regards to the North Daniels. Some people believe in hands-on discipline. I was personally never for it, but that's what a canetada is. It's a 39 second beat down.
Now, I don't know what, what the significance of 39 seconds is, a 39 second canetada, but I know that they do it in increments of 13. So obviously it starts with 13. 13 and 13 is 26. Another 13 is 39. And another 13 after that is 52. So they do it in increments of 13. Now, according to Weddle, the reason why he kept getting canetadas is because his lady, she just wasn't going for it. And he never put that burden on her. He said on one occasion, he went out to the visiting room against his better judgment and he sat his lady down and he explained to her what the expectations were, that their families or their girls or their moms, whoever was coming up to visit was being expected to bring in drugs for him. And he said, you know, when I explained this to my lady, I didn't even want to do it. I didn't even want to disrespect her like that. But I put it in her hands and I figured, you know what? I was going to respect whatever she said. And he said that he knew that she wasn't going to bring dope in no matter what he said, or regardless of who was expecting that to happen, that she wasn't going to do it. Because for one, she just wasn't the type of hyena that would do something like that. For two, she always brought their kids up. So she wasn't about to take a chance of her kids getting taken by child services because she got caught trying to smuggle in a bag of dope for his people. So he said he just basically took the ganetadas every time he came back. 39 seconds, come on, let's go, let's get it over with. So Weddle said that he had already gotten multiple ganetadas and that aside from punishing the individual that was refusing to bring in dope, this was also meant to serve as a warning to others, meaning the other sureños that seen these canetadas being administered. So besides Huero, there were other sureños on the yard that were also getting canetadas. He wasn't the lone ranger. There was another sureño by the name of Lucky from Santa Maria, the Oxnard area, who also got several canetadas. He didn't really explain why his situation escalated the way it did or what made him different, but I'm assuming this was considered on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm sure there was probably some things that they took into consideration when they were administering these canetadas. Who this individual is, you know, is he a youngster? Is he an older guy? Is he somebody that's been around? Has he made contributions in the past? What type of individual he was? So at some point, Lucky either got tired of these 39-second beatdowns or his girl felt sorry for him because she finally ended up agreeing to start bringing in dope by the time they got their third visit. You know, by the time they had their third visit and, you know, Lucky was explaining to her why he was coming out there looking like a raccoon, why he was coming out there lumped up all the time, he finally broke it down and told her, he's like, look, this is what they expect us to do. The same way Weddle had that conversation with his girl, Lucky had the same conversation with his. And he explained it to her, you know, this is what they expect us to do. And, you know, this is the concept. I'm supposed to do this as, as an honorable sureño. And all sureños are obligated to you know, these kind of expectations. So after explaining to her why they were putting hands on him, she finally agreed. She was probably like, you know what, babe, fuck it, I'll do it. I'll do it. If that's what I need to do in order for this to stop, then I'll do it. Big mistake. And I say that, you know, with all due respect. Because I always understood the potential of what could happen once you know, you involve your, your wife or a family member, when you involve them in these kind of politics, it puts them in harm's way. There's scenario after scenario I could give you guys, but I'm sure you guys are smart enough to figure a lot of this stuff out on your own. The other thing you guys got to understand is this. Once she agreed to bring drugs in, once she said, okay, I'll bring them in, the way that they're going to look at it is she committed herself. She obligated herself. When she said that she would be willing to do it, from that point on, she was obligated. And I'm sure this is something she probably didn't even think about. At the time she said it, she probably just wanted, you know, the beat downs to stop. She she probably got tired of explaining to her kids why their daddy kept coming out there looking like a raccoon. So according to Weddle, there was another sureño by the name of Ruko from 18th Street. And he had all the dope. And he was in charge of managing all the dope on that yard for Woody. So it was Ruko's job to keep a running tab on all the sureños who were bringing drugs in. And it was also his job to regulate all the drugs that they were selling on the yard. They were the ones who put the drugs that needed to come in in the hands of other sureños visitors on that yard. In other words, both Ruko and Little Man had people on the streets that would meet up with anyone who had upcoming visits. And then they would give them the drugs to bring in. So apparently Ruko and Little Man coordinated all the drugs that were coming in. If there was a sureño that had a visit the following week, they would obviously get with him, get his people's contact information, and then they would pass that on to their people 
and they'd have their people meet them somewhere out on the streets and drop off a package so that they could bring it in on the following visit. That's what they were in charge of doing, besides regulating all the drugs that were being sold out there on the yard. So after Lucky had that conversation with his hyena about bringing dope in, Lucky went to Ruko and Little Man and he told him, he's like, hey, I talked to my hyena, she's ready to go. She's willing to bring a package in. So here's her contact information, have your people get at her and she'll meet them anywhere out there in the area of, I would imagine somewhere out there by, by Oxnard, Santa Maria. So from that point on, Ruko or Little Man had their people contact his old lady and they made all the arrangements with her over the phone. We'll meet you out here somewhere halfway in between. Such and such is going to call you. They're going to get a hold of you and they'll probably meet you somewhere in this area right here. They're going to meet up with you. They're going to give you a package. It's going to be sealed. It's going to be taped up. When you get that package, just bring it in the same way that you get it. Don't open it up. Don't break the seal on it. Don't do none of that. Just bring it in the same way that you get it. So that actually happened. Lucky's old lady, she met up with their people on the streets and they gave her a package. She takes this package. She goes home and in between the time she got the package and the time she had a visit, she had several conversations with Lucky. And I'm sure one of the things that Lucky continued to emphasize over the course of the next couple of days was the importance of bringing that package in, not, not breaking the seal on it, bringing it in just like she got it. He probably gave her some pointers and told her the best way to do it is like this, walked her through the whole process. So I'm pretty sure Lucky said everything he could possibly say to her to convince her to bring it in. I'm sure he assured her that everything was going to be okay. She wasn't going to get busted. People do it all the time, every day. They get away with it every week not to worry about it. And he probably told her everything he needed to tell her to, to assure her that it was going to work out the way it was supposed to. So he righteously did everything that he could do to encourage her to bring it in. And as far as he was concerned, when he went to sleep the night before that visit, everything was, was ready to go. Now, the unfortunate thing is that people on the streets don't understand prison politics and the kind of anticipation that goes into something like this. That's a good way to piss some people off. I mean, imagine all these guys in prison that are locked up and who invest all their time and energy in the brainwashing viable ways to get drugs in to feed their habits, only to find out that it didn't come in. That's a bad accident waiting to happen. The tweakers who are waiting to slam back some meth and get all gout out is one thing. If it doesn't come in, they'll live and they can tweak another day. But the guys who were all strung out on heroin and who literally did their last bag the night before in anticipation for that package that's coming in the next day, try explaining to them why it didn't come in. That's a different kind of animal. You try explaining why your girl changed her mind or why somebody couldn't remember where they put that package the night before to somebody who's about to go into full withdrawal. And when you don't, now you're the one to blame why they're feeling sick. This is something people don't understand unless they've experienced it. In situations like that, your girl, your mom, your family, whoever it was that was supposed to bring drugs in are held to the same standards as you are. Even though they don't really grasp or understand prison politics, it doesn't matter. They're going to say they obligated themselves when they agreed to it. They shouldn't have dropped the ball in a situation like this, period. But here's the cold part about these scenarios. She ends up getting cracked in the visiting room. She goes to make the pass. She does it sloppy. They see it and she gets busted. Their girl goes to jail. Their kids get gaffled up. Do you think anybody's going to feel bad for them? Do you think anybody's going to do anything for them? And who's to blame? You know how it would go. They'd be left to fend for themselves. And they probably tell them that it was their fault because they weren't smarter. Or, you know, they, they should have been more security conscious that they somehow brought it on themselves. Like War said, it gets cold outside. So unfortunately for Lucky, the worst case scenario would end up happening. After his girl agrees to bring up this package, little man has his people meet her, and now she comes up the following day to visit. After all the kind of thoughts that Lucky had gotten, I'm sure he went out to the visiting room thinking, damn, I'm finally about to make a contribution to the casa. I'm finally about to do something that's going to earn me some points. But if that was going to happen, it wasn't going to happen on that day. So Lucky goes out to the visiting room and his girl, she ends up dropping a bomb on him. She basically tells him, she's like, 
I've been up all night. I've been thinking about this package. I couldn't go to sleep. It was the only thing on my mind. I kept thinking about losing the kids. I kept thinking about what happens if I get busted. So she basically tells him that she got cold feet and she ended up flushing the dope. Furthermore, she tells him that she's scared and she just didn't want to take a chance of losing the kids. I'm sure that Lucky probably felt sick when his girl was telling him this. He's probably thinking, man, this is going to be all bad. I'm going to have to go explain this to Ruko and Little Man. Woody's not going to be happy. You know, I've been getting these canetadas. It's going to get worse now. How am I going to explain this? He probably felt sick. But, you know, this is a burden that these guys are placing on people's personal families. That's foul. That's something that I've never done as a leader. I never implemented a policy like this where I would tell somebody that they had to have their mother bring in some dope. Somebody that might not have ever been around drugs before. Nor would I tell somebody to have their lady bring drugs in when she's bringing their kids up to visit. Sometimes you just got to draw the line. Money is important. Becoming self-sufficient, self-solvent. Those things are important. And these are Woody's responsibilities. However, it's also his responsibility to draw a line and say, you know what? I'm not going to put my people through that. I'm going to use a little bit of discretion. There's just something taboo about that. Where's the ethics in that? You know, one of the things that I've always stood by whenever I was in a leadership position is to never implement something on somebody else that I wouldn't want done to me. But I want my mom bringing dope in? Absolutely not. So why am I going to have somebody else's mom bring dope in? Would I want the mother of my kids to bring my kids up to visit me while she's trying to hand me a package of dope? Absolutely not. So I obviously don't know how the conversation went between Lucky and his girl. I imagine he was probably mad at one point, was probably blaming her, telling her, how, you know, I'm going to have to go back here and explain why you agreed to do this and why I don't have the dope. And I'm going to have to explain why you flushed the dope. Why did you flush it? Why didn't you just hide it somewhere and give it back? But now that you flushed it, I'm going to be on the hook for that. How am I going to pay that back? I'm pretty sure he had a shitty visit that day. Even if his kids were there, I'm sure that this killed the move. He's obviously worried about the repercussions that he's going to have to face now. And, you know, things are kind of funny between him and his girl. He just blamed her. But nonetheless, that's what happened. Can Lucky really blame his old lady for flushing it, for getting spooked when, you know, she's got his kids, when she's out there struggling by herself and he puts this extra burden on her? Can he really blame her for that when she really doesn't understand prison politics. She don't understand how all that works. You know, when I was younger, I did put some of those burdens, some of those same kind of burdens on some of the women that I had relationships with and family because I didn't I didn't really understand how politics really worked. I didn't understand the long-term effect or what I was getting them into until later on, until I really understood politics, but you know, these are the these are the kind of things that happen all the time. And I'm sure he was even madder at her for flushing it because even if they were to give him a pass, now they can't even recover that dough. So after Lucky's visit, he comes out of the visiting room and, you know, he's walking across the yard and he sees Ruko and Little Man. They're making a beeline straight for him. These guys don't even give him a chance to get situated. They literally were waiting on the yard for him to come out of his visit so that they can jam him up about their package. And if Lucky wasn't sick in the visiting room, I'm sure he was probably feeling sick when he was walking across the yard. So when Ruko and Little Man asked Lucky if, they, if he had their package, all they heard him say is no. They didn't hear none of his explanations. They didn't hear nothing that he said about his girl. They didn't hear nothing but no. And they were pissed. Lucky standing there trying to explain himself and they turn around and walk away in mid-sentence. He didn't even get finished telling them what happened. They just turned around and walked away. Can you imagine what he was probably thinking at that point? He's probably thinking, man, these motherfuckers, they're going to hit me. I mean, it's a cold situation to be in. Lucky did everything he possibly could to encourage his girl to bring that dope in. He did his part. He did everything that he could. His girl, she ended up getting spooked. There's nothing he can do about that. So, you know, Lucky was really trying to do what he could. And now here he is trying to explain to the homies why she didn't have it. And he gets the cold shoulder. They turn around and walk away. They don't even give him the respect of finishing what he had to say. So being that this was Woody's yard, I'm pretty sure he's the one that meted out 
Lucky's discipline. At any rate, whoever it was, they decided that they were going to end Lucky's career by putting his consequences clearly out of his reach because they ended up hitting Lucky with a ridiculous $10,000 fine, knowing that he couldn't pay that kind of money. You know, and his financial situation wasn't no secret. Weddle said that everybody out there on the yard knew that he wasn't no baller and that, you know, he didn't have nothing. He didn't have a lot. These are things anybody could see out there on the yard. You know who the ballers are. When it's time to go to canteen, you got guys that are going full draw. They got radios, TVs. They got everything that they needed. They're always wearing brand new tennis shoes, thermal sweats, jeans. They always got jewelry on. All the things that you can get, they got. But Lucky, he's lucky if he makes it to canteen once every two or three months. He doesn't have a whole lot out there. Matter of fact, according to Weddle, Lucky had a little side hustle where he put together those little picture frames where you fold up the pieces of paper and you put the cellophane around them. That was kind of like his little side hustle where he would make just a little bit of money so that he could get his necessities his cosmetics and things like that but he didn't really have that kind of money so for them to hit him with the ten thousand dollar fine they knew they were ending his career he wasn't going to be able to pay that so lucky doesn't even try to pay it he basically tells ruko and little man hey look i can't pay this ten thousand dollar fine i don't have the means to do it if i had it i would pay it but i i, I just don't have it so they end up whacking lucky the following day on the yard Apparently, he was out there sitting at the Ventura County table and sent two shooters to stab him. And then they had a couple bombers come in and bomb on him. So after they hit Lucky, they put the yard down and it's probably like they didn't even stay on lockdown but for a couple of days. Situations like that, the administration looks at it as, you know what, they're just they're cleaning house or they're, they're just getting rid of one of their own. There's no reason to keep them on a long lockdown. So they were probably on lockdown for three or four days, and then they came right back out. And when I say that Lucky was sitting at the Ventura County table, that just kind of gave me an idea of how that yard was divided out there. Because according to Weddle, you had the IE car sitting over here, the Ventura County car sitting over here, the LA County car over here, the OC car. So they were all kind of split up. So the moral of this part of the story is that just because Lucky failed to bring in dope for the Mesa and because he failed at upholding the new policies that Woody endorsed, he was whacked. And according to Widow, it was a cold removal. They sent two shooters on him like he was a piece of shit. And a lot of Sureños on that yard didn't think he had that coming. And to add insult to injury, they did it at the Ventura County table in front of all the Sureños that had love for him. Weddle described it as if they had snaked him. He said they came up behind him with weapons and blasted the shit out of him. But this was all predicated on this ridiculous fine he was hit with. $10,000 isn't no chump change, especially when you're locked up or, you know, in a situation like this when you just don't have it. Anyways, not long after this incident, a second incident took place on this yard. And I'm going to just run you guys through it real quick. So not long after Lucky got hit, another situation ended up taking place on that same yard with another Sureño by the name of Scrappy from Arcadia. According to Weddle, Scrappy had a job working with the landscaping crew. So according to Weddle, Scrappy had a job working on the landscaping crew. And apparently he knocked his boss, who was a female free staff. And for those of you that don't understand Ebonics, he was having an affair with her. That's what knocked means. <laughs> so the landscaping crew was supposed to be one of the, the better jobs out there on the yard. It was a three-man crew. They worked under this female free staff lady. And all they really did was cut some of the bushes down. They edged the lawn. And they just they kept up the landscape. That's what they did. Scrappy's boss was a female employee who drove around the yard in a small orange golf cart type of vehicle. Now, I'm not sure who the third guy was that worked on their team. But there was another Sureño named Evil from Longo who worked with Scrappy on that crew. So apparently after Scrappy got into this relationship with this female staff person, you know, after they were giving each other the goo-goo eyes and playing kissy face, he managed to convince her to start bringing in small amounts of yesca and tobacco for him. For those of you who don't know what yesca is, it's weed, pot, ganji, marijuana. <laughs> and I'm assuming that he must have been working with this female staff person for a while because these, these kind of things, you have an inmate that's involved in a relationship with either a CO or a female staff person, somebody that works in the kitchen, a counselor, 
it takes a lot of time for somebody to invest that kind of trust in you where they're putting their job and their career on the line. So I'm sure they were probably doing the goo goo eyes and the kissy face for a good minute before she agreed to start bringing in tobacco and weed. And according to Weddle, the tobacco and weed that she was bringing in, it was nothing. She'd bring in like maybe a pack of cigarettes and, you know, an eighth of weed or something like that. And she would do that maybe like once a week. But it, was, it wasn't it was nothing. It wasn't even enough to really make some money. Nothing in comparison to what comes in through the visiting room. He probably had a couple lanyards to twist up and give to, you know, some of his homies and a little bit of tobacco. But... It was nothing major. So the only other person that knew that Scrappy was getting this tobacco and the weed in was Evil from Long Beach. Evil was the only other one in that yard that knew. Nobody else knew. So Weddle said that at some point, Evil took it upon himself to go and report the details of the relationship that Scrappy was having with this female staff person. And he also let the Mesa know that Scrappy was getting in weed and tobacco and that he wasn't reporting it. The other thing I forgot to mention to you guys was who else was part of the Mesa. Both Ruko and Little Man were part of the Mesa. The other thing I forgot to mention to you guys is who Woody appointed as his Mesa on that yard. Now, aside from Ruko and Little Man from 18th Street, you also had Lobo from Maravilla, Cowboy from 18th Street, Snoopy from Great Street, and Turtle from Artesia. These were all Mesa members. So apparently Evil, he goes and tells the Mesa that Scrappy's involved in this relationship with this female staff person. He's bringing in all this dope. And he does it because he's envious. He's envious of Scrappy. And he wants to be the one that's in a relationship with this Aina. He's jealous. I mean, if you really want to get technical, yeah, Scrappy was violating the policies that Woody implemented. Because aside from the drug policy that I already outlined for you guys, anytime anybody brought any drugs in on that yard, they were required to give one third of that to the casa. Basically, one third of that was taken off the top and that would go to Woody. So Scrappy didn't report this. He never reported it. He was never breaking off a third of what he was getting. But again, this was... You're talking about a pack of cigarettes and like an eighth of weed. That's nothing. But the way that Evil paints the picture is that, you know, Scrappy, he's he's beating you guys. He's cheating you out of your, your one third. He's purposely not reporting this because, you know, he, he's being dirty about it. You know, I don't think anybody can say that Scrappy had malicious intentions because we're talking about a small amount of Yeska and tobacco. And he wasn't even selling it. This was more for just personal consumption and just to smoke for himself. So this results in Scrappy getting whacked the following day for, as they say, he was breaking policy and taking advantage of the Mesa. The following day after Evil reported it, they sent another Sureño by the name of Casper from Grape Street Watts to hit Scrappy on the yard in front of building four. Casper ends up whacking him four or five times. Then they sent in a couple of bombers to bomb monitors. They don't fiend him. And then they put the yard down, they're on lockdown for two or three days, and then they come back out. So the moral of the second part of this story is that another good Sureño gets hit behind his own boy hating on him. All because he was envious of what he couldn't have himself. And then to add salt to the wound, Evil ended up taking Scrappy's position as the lead on the landscaping crew. And then he went and advised the Mesa that he was going to attempt to get into a relationship with this same Ina and that he was going to try to bring in tobacco and weed, but that he was going to make sure that they got their issue. Oh boy, sure was trying to earn some brownie points. The truth always comes out. Why nobody was able to see through his agenda remains a mystery. But at the end of the day, it was all over money. Did either one of these two Sureños deserve to get whacked? You guys tell me what you think in the comments. But here's the other thing. This story right here, especially what happened to Lucky, it demonstrates how cutthroat politics are out of control. Where do you draw the line? Is this the way people's families are really treated? Since when was it okay to treat people's families like this? Since when was it okay to ask somebody's mother to bring in dope? Since when was it okay to have your girl bring in dope while she's got your kids with her? What happened to our families, our loved ones being some of our most purest reflections? What happened to that? That's just it. It's not about that no more. It's all about making money. And then it's all about putting your foot on your own people's throats 
and forcing them to do things like what they made Lucky do. That's foul. And again, these stories, there's not a shortage of them. This is commonplace out there. This is what happens out there all the time. Different faces, different people, different places. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed these two stories. I try to get through them a little faster. Some of you are saying that these stories are too long. So I'm going to start trying to shorten them up. Anyways, on a closing note, you guys let me know what you think in the comments when it comes to having people's mothers or their wives with their kids bring in dope, making it a mandatory requirement. Let me know what you think. Drop a comment. I hope you guys are ready for the new year. Let's bring in 2024 with a bang. I appreciate you guys tapping in. I appreciate the support. See you on the next one. This your boy B and I'm out.